Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, I'm Frank Goodyear, along with my wife, Anne. Uh, I serve as one of the co-directors of the Museum of Art here at Bowdoin. This is a very special afternoon as we gather to hear from four members of Bowdoin's visual arts department, Jackie Brown, Mike Colster, Jim Mullen, and Mark Wetley. This program uh, has been organized in conjunction with At First Light, Two Centuries of Artists in Maine, which remains on view uh, until November 6th. Back in 2017, when Anne and I first began developing this exhibition, these four artists each generously agreed to allow us to feature one of their artworks in the show. We reached out to them, not simply because they are outstanding colleagues and beloved classroom instructors, but because they each maintain an active studio practice centered here in Maine. We thought that displaying their work might provide a snapshot of contemporary art making in the state. In addition, having chosen to include artworks by former faculty members, Thomas Cornell, John McKee, David Driscoll, and Aaron Johnson, we wanted to also, I think, demonstrate the importance of Bowdoin's visual arts department to the main art scene, both today and historically. The two-year postponement of At First Light because of the pandemic has meant that the exhibition coincides with the 60th anniversary of the department, which was established in 1962 with the appointment of Thomas Cornell as its first tenured professor. As such, this afternoon's program is both an opportunity to learn more about the work of these four terrific artists, as well as a celebration of the department. On this occasion, I want also to recognize the other outstanding artists who currently teach in the visual arts department, namely Mary Hart, Deep Mukabatai, Carrie Skanga, and Audrey Shakespeare. I also want to give a shout out to Gina Edwards, the academic department coordinator who helps facilitate so many activities at the Edwards Center for Art and Dance. For the sake of time, I'm not going to provide a typical introduction to each participant. Instead, I will allow each of them to say something about their practice and background. This afternoon's program is going to proceed in two parts. During the first half, Jackie, Mike, Jim, and Mark are going to share a few words about their respective artworks in At First Light and how this work relates to their larger artistic practice. And then during the second half, Anne and I will join uh, these four on stage for a group conversation and questions from the audience. That said, without further delay, please welcome Jackie Brown. All right, can you hear me all right? All right, hi everyone, I'm Jackie. Thank you for being here. Um, thank you, Anne and Frank, for, uh, it's really exciting to be able to share our work and exhibit our work together. This is, is momentous for the department, um, so thank you. Um, I'm going to jump right in. I, I have some work that I'd like to share with you. And All right, so this is my work. My work primarily takes the form of sculpture installation, immersive environments that you can physically walk through and explore. This is the largest installation that I've done, and it's the work I completed just before starting the aggregate series that's on view at the museum. The work combines these three installations together, and it's the work that I've dedicated most of my life as an artist to developing. All of these were fueled by an interest in living systems, in what it means to be alive, in processes of growth and change. And each one evolved gradually through its own inquiry and through its own series of shifting and expanding installations. An installation itself as a way of working became a way of enacting change and transformation through my own process and practice. And that's where eventually the idea of combining the installations together came to mind. Oh, thank you. That's by combining the installations themselves and using the entire installations as parts to an even larger whole, I could take that potential for transformation a step further, 
so the forms were truly malleable with this unlimited potential to morph and change and take on new life. This was an exciting moment for me, and it was the peak of over 10 years of installation work. And then I was faced with the question of what comes next? Where do I go from there? And that brings me to the work that's on view at the museum. So a little bit of a shift here. Uh, this was a very transitional time for me, and this work offered a point of departure. It's still part of a conversation for me about flux and change and about the shifting nature of living systems, but it allowed me to engage the ideas that have been central to my work through new ways of making and exploring. I was challenged by going from large to small, from environments to objects, from many materials to a focus on clay as a medium for sculpture. And I especially relished the challenge of making small objects, of working to craft something that could hold its own on an intimate scale, that could become a world unto itself, and that could invite someone to look and to keep looking. And I gained a new appreciation for how hard that can be. So there are 36 of these small objects on view at the museum. You can see 64 of them here, and I made many more than that. So there was this sort of frenzy of making, and then there was this period of spending time with the objects and of editing that was equally important. And the conversation for me is always shifting as I'm making the work. So early on, I was focused on rope as a historical object and the use of knots, in part from moving to Maine, which has an extensive maritime history, in part from teaching a mold making class and asking my students to think about the potential for everyday objects to carry meaning. And I went down this sort of rabbit hole, looking across time and across cultures, uh, looking at everything from early pulley systems to surgical knots to knot theory and mathematics. But ultimately, I came back to its physicality, its simplicity. Rope as a basic tool is something we can shape with our hands and it's something that, that everyone is familiar with in that way. So I made molds of, the, of rope and of sticks and of branches and I cast them in clay and by combining the clay parts and wrapping them around forms that suggest rock, this became a way for me to connect the natural and the man-made, to sort of tangle them together and to think about our relationship to our environment. Um, especially what I see is our de desire often to sort of try to harness and control our environment. There was something interesting to me about translating rope into a rigid ceramic, into a material that has a breaking point and doesn't quite do what rope is supposed to do. The forms can seem like fossils or something that's been unearthed and has a sense of time and history to it. There's also an element in the work that connects the body and the environment. So many of the forms suggest bone or even organs inside the body. And I like this. I like this because we often think of ourselves as separate from our environment, but we're very much a part of it. And then finally, there's an element of entropy and decay in the work. Entropy and decay, which are essential to growth. And I love the idea that all organic matter eventually becomes a source for new life. So for me, each object is a touchstone. It's a, they're jumping points for reflecting on our understanding of and our relationship to the world around us. And I hope that they are simultaneously at once suggest something that is alive and growing, dead and decaying, moving and malleable, frozen and rigid, ecological, geological, and anthropomorphic. And I also just hope that they're interesting to look at and engage with and that they raise different questions and connections and associations for each viewer who encounters them. So I'll stop there. Thank you. All right, nice job. <laughs> Test, check. All right, um, let's see if I can run this thing. Okay, um, yeah, I want to um, echo uh, Jackie's thanks to Anne and Frank and to the museum for this opportunity. Um, and to realize that I've been here for 22 years and I haven't had the opportunity to hear my colleagues present in such a way before. Um, and it's really um, pretty wonderful. I uh, hope I can reciprocate a little bit after Jackie's um, talk. And, and you've been on leave for a little bit. You haven't lost your edge. <laughs> nice. Um, so what I'm going to do is um, just talk about uh, the piece that's in First Light and describe a little bit of some of the ways it was made um, and some of the reasons why it was made that way. Um, and 
we'll, we'll kind of give you a little bit of a sense of the project that it comes from. So I'm going to um, limit uh, my comments mainly to the Rivers project. Um, I've been working on a bunch of other things before and since, but I'm going to sort of focus in on what was up, what is up in the museum right now. So um, this is actually a, a depiction of um, a section of river in uh, Lewiston, Auburn. So it's right in between two, two bridges. And it's actually a panel of four different glass plates. Um, and those glass plates are referred to as ambrotypes. And um, I'll talk a little bit about what that means in a little bit. Um, the project itself um, comes from uh, an extended period of time of shooting along four different rivers on the East Coast and culminated in the publication of a book called Take Me to the River. Um, and this actually is on the cover of the book, and it's from the Swinging Bridge here in, um, you know, sort of Topsom, Brunswick. Um, and then um, one other book came out of the Rivers Project as well, um, where I went across the country and went over to Los Angeles and photographed the river there. Um, and I'll try to explain in a little bit more uh, detail in a bit um, why these kinds of places. Um, but first, um, I want to describe a little bit of what the wet plate um, photographic process is about, why one would you sort of even try to do this sort of thing in the first place. Um, you can see that this is a photograph of me with the camera um, along actually the channel of the Los Angeles River, and that's the camp that I set up in order to make the pictures. Um, the pictures are handmade, and they're made on site, and they're made on glass, and they're ridiculously fun to make, though um, they're also, uh, um, well, you never know what you're going to get, basically. Um, so the, essentially what we're looking at in the museum or right here is an image um, that's on glass, and it's held against basically a black background. So it's a piece of glass, literally, that was put in the back of the camera, and that was the thing that received the light and comprises the image. Um, it's unique in, in that sense then. Um, there's only one of them. Um, and um, it's held by these standoffs slightly off of a black plexi background, and I'll explain why in a second. Um, really, these photographs are negatives. They're very faint negatives. Um, and the thing that's so interesting about them to me is the fact that when you make them and you look at them with light coming through them or with a white background, they appear as a negative. But when you put a black background behind them, they transform. And that transformation um, has always been kind of jaw-dropping to me. I can't explain it. I think it's kind of magical. Um, and it was the thing that always got me and still gets me really excited about how to make, you know, in making these things. So um, I'll give you a little bit of a background on literally how these things are put together. Um, the box you see on the right um, is a box that um, is my dark room um, in the field. Um, and so these things are literally made from scratch um, where I'm making the picture. Um, so I have uh, a bunch of chemistry, I've got water, I've got my dark box, and basically I've got my large camera um, in which the uh, plate of glass gets put into the back. Um, I thought I had a video of pouring the syrupy collodion on top of the plate, which is the substrate for the, um, the or actually it's the, the emulsion that holds my silver. Um, that's really kind of fun to see. I guess it didn't make it into this version. But this is the development of the plate. And I can't understand why it's actually so dark. But um, I'm in a dark box, after all. But um, this is what happens when you pour the developer on the plate. And I'm sitting in the middle of a field right inside this box. And the image starts to come up. And it's by inspection. It happens quickly. And then you've got to pull it or throw water on it to make it um, no longer develop. And then in the field, it starts to clear, and you start to see this image coming up. And so it's a lot of fun, because people come by, and they see this dark box and all this chemistry and this big camera, and they ask me, what are you doing? And I can show them. I can show them a picture right away. Um, the irony, of course, is the fact that this is one of the oldest processes. It comes from 1851. It was invented then. It was used primarily between 1851 until um, uh, 1880s when the dry plate came around. So any photograph you see from the Civil War, any photograph you see from the, um, the railroad survey projects out west um, through the 1870s were made using this process. I've done maybe 2,000 plates, and I still don't understand. I can't imagine how these people were able to make plates out in Colorado with mules 
carrying 20 by 24 inch pieces of glass up to these areas where they're taking pictures. Um, it's still kind of, um, it flummoxes me. But anyway, um, what, what basically happens is that you get to inspect the image on site, get to check it out, see whether it works. Um, and then um, basically what you have, if you were to see the piece in the museum um, with a light table or just held up against a white background as most images are held up as, um, you'd see this as a negative. But in fact, when it goes in front of a black background, it does that reversal. So um, the, um, the project is one that um, I found myself working on these rivers, especially starting with the Androscoggin here in Maine and uh, in part of New Hampshire. Um, and part of it was the fact that I was really interested in the fact that the history of these rivers are, um, well, they're troubled. Um, and the Androscoggin was one of the most polluted rivers in the United States up until, well, not that long ago, actually. And in fact, I think it's not today, I think it's in a few days, um, is the 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act. And um, what, it, what interested me is the fact that um, the um, Androscoggin River was the river that the author of the Clean Water Act grew up on, Edmund Muskie. And so that um, here we are in Brunswick, um, here we have this river that was biologically dead 40 years ago, um, is now actually a place where there are bald eagles and there are um, fish, big fish swimming in it that I like catching. Um, and it has this interesting appearance almost of it being a recovered river. But in fact, it's not. Um, I don't think it's a good idea for you to eat anything out of it. It still has these complicated problems associated with a, a place that has been adulterated and changed. Um, and so what really interested me about these kinds of rivers was the fact that their appearances aren't necessarily telling the whole story and that how does one begin to embrace what I think is some of the natural beauty or just the pleasure of being near it now, whereas before you would be sick being near it, and also reference its historical legacies. And so that I started using a historical process to photograph the river. Um, uh, interestingly enough, the historic process is one that came about around the same time as these rivers became adulterated. I started really thinking that, in fact, we can't separate out the forces that caused um, the uh, adulteration of these rivers and changed them so much. We can't separate them out from, basically, the invention of photography and other kinds of technologies. So it was sort of interesting to me to think about the historical coincidence of these two things. And then, of course, at the same time, um, making photographs, uh, uh, one more, well, making photographs this way um, is photographing a wet subject using a wet process. And so that the subject itself becomes embodied within the images themselves. Um, I'm trying to control these um, strange fluid uh, processes in, in making the picture. And here I am photographing something that is just as hard to control as well. And so what I thought about was the fact that the rivers and nature start to become comparable. And in fact, we think about nature as being non-human, as being pure, spontaneous, virtuous, wild. And yet these rivers are really human altered. They're partially restored. They're inhibited. They're damned. They're a bit compromised, yet they're extremely dynamic. And then at the same time, the amber type, or the way that I was making these pictures, had similar kinds of problems and adulterations or curiosities associated with them that I found also within these rivers. Um, handmade, unique, protean, flawed, immaculate, perhaps, and even magical. And so um, the amber types basically ask me to find new ways to see and imagine the rivers in our backyards. Um, and so one of the goals, ultimately, and I think this applies across the board as far as my project goes, is trying to engage with what I call discernment. And that discernment is perception in the absence of judgment with a view to obtaining spiritual direction and understandings. So in other words, when you come to look at the Androscoggin, what kind of associations do you have with it? Do you see it as beautiful or do you see it as fallen? Um, and it'd be nice to be able to sort of see it in as many different ways as possible. Um, so make a plug. Um, new book that's out. Um, we've got a book launch next Thursday at the Bowdoin Library. Please come check it out, 4.30. And show opens next week at the University of New England Art Gallery. Um, please come to the reception Friday the 21st, um, next week from 4 to 7, down on Stevens Avenue in Portland. All right, thanks.
Great. Um, I would like to echo um, my colleagues and say thank you so much to Anna and Frank and everybody for coming out today. I really appreciate it. Um, I really wish I had gone before Mike. Um, but what I'm going to do in the brief time that uh, we've been asked to speak is this is the piece that I have in the exhibition. I'm going to talk about a little bit of context for it and how it plays into my larger project. And then I want to do something a little bit different. I just want to talk for several minutes about uh, some work I've been doing recently, which is a little bit different, because I think that might be interesting. So this painting is based on a photograph that I took up on top of Acadia just after sunrise. And I think, it, if I remember correctly, it was about three years ago this week. So it was going up in the fall after things had shut down up there, and I went up to the top of Cadillac Mountain. And it was um, really exquisite uh, light because there was no humidity. And I really loved it. And I shot a couple hundred photographs with my phone while I was up there. And when I got back and I came across this image, I immediately identified that it was something that I wanted to paint. And I wanted to celebrate the light. And I also wanted to make it larger. And um, one of the things that I really enjoyed about working this large is that it took on an environmental quality. And what I mean by that is that when I'm standing about 10 feet in front of the painting, it really echoes my experience of the space when I was up there, in that when I turn to my left, the light is coming clearly from the left angle. And when I turn to the right, the light's coming from the right. So it kind of echoed a site-specific manner about this, my relationship to the visual field and what I was seeing. And that's why my shadow's in the middle of the painting. And so in some ways, that's an opportunity for the viewer to imagine or project themselves into it as a way of sharing that um, sense of that space and that kind of grandeur of it. It was just a really, really lovely thing. And I'm really motivated by light and by that quality of light and a sort of eternal moment and trying to find a way to capture that and develop it. So this is an oil painting. I'm an oil painter, <coughs> pardon me. And, um, but part of my practice, especially since we were talking about kids earlier today, um, I used to work outdoor on site all the time, and then um, I was lucky enough, we started a family, so my schedule changed dramatically, and I ended up not having big open blocks of time to sip coffee and paint endlessly by a river. So I started uh, taking photographs, and I started working in a really directed manner from photography because it gave me opportunity to work in other times that would fit a sort of larger schedule. So I've always worked with photographs, but um, I've always used it as a sort of preparation for the painting process. And then over the course of the last 10 years, I've started using, um, like a lot of people, with my phone, my iPhone, and then just shooting. And I found that there was an ease of shooting that I really enjoyed, and it really changed how I started seeing things. And I really enjoyed the openness of it and the low threshold for technology. I mean, <laughs> low threshold. Think about ambrotype. Oh my God, I'm like click, 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 you know? So it's like, it's so much easier. So, um, but the, the spontaneity of that allowed for a sort of responsiveness and an immediacy that uh, changed how I thought about how I composed my paintings. And so I found it really helpful. Um, so now what I'm gonna show is this. The drawing on the left is a digital drawing of Acadia. It's from uh, the side of the same place up there at Blue Hill Overlook on Cadillac Mountain. And um, where it comes from is about 10 years ago when I was in the city, I went to the Morgan Library in Midtown. And almost every time I go to the city for the last 10 years, I go to the Morgan. And one of the exhibitions they have is Illuminated Manuscript in their collection of Catherine of Cleves. And it blew me away. It made a really deep, solid impact on me, and I wasn't entirely sure why. So during my leave, I, I preach all the time in my classes. They hear me talk about like being willing to experiment and fail at something and fall down. And you don't have to know where you're headed for it to be of value to, to make that move. So when I went on to my leave, I spent the first several months doing painting. But then I decided I will never have a better chance to go back and explore what this is about for me. So I started investigating. This is a. Um, digital image of one of the pages from that manuscript, and I just started drawing over it. And I was trying to figure out what it was I was attracted to. And part of it was the idea of an image within an image, and that the image was surrounded by this organic decorative presence that started changing the context for it. And there was kind of a conversation between the artifice and the natural. So as I was doing that, I had been working on a scanner on, some, on several projects. And it occurred to me, why don't I just try to use the scanner for that? So what you're looking at on the right is a scan of a photograph that I had taken that I printed out and I just put on the glass of the scanner. And then I started placing flowers around it. 
and I started building the space above the scanner. So I was really ignorant about this. I found out scanography is a thing. There's a term, there's chat groups, there's all sorts of stuff about it. But most of the images on scanners are kind of like that thing when you press up against the glass, you know, or um, you do a grease relief in middle school. And so one of the things is I didn't want everything to just feel smushed right up there. So what I did was I'm, I think about light and I think about space all the time. So I started building a dimensional space on the scanner. And instead of using the scanner for um, that shallow space, I started using it for time. Because a scanner takes 10 to 15 seconds to take a photograph. So I just basically used it as my camera. But it gave me different options. So this was in the uh, middle of last winter, and then I just went nuts. And so um, both of these are just straight photos uh, of the scans. There's no post-production. There's no Photoshop. There's nothing. And so, for example, the piece on the right, this is just a print I made on my printer in the studio, and I laid it on the glass. Then I surrounded the space, and then I illuminated behind the space with a range of different materials, including plastics that I got on Canal Street in New York. So I got really into this. Like, I got really into this. I did several hundred of these. And then one of the things that occurred to me is that I could also create aggregate images by doing multiple scans and then assembling them as modules. So I was scanning on my 12 by 9 inch scan or my Epson in the studio, but I realized I could use multiple images to create composite um, conversations. So this was the most structured one I did, and it's uh, quite obviously about color, and it's all about complementary color. And so if you look, the primary colors I could find in Portland in January, I would find the flowers, and then I would create environments of the complementary palette and start to play with it. So I'll show you some details real quick of these. Um, and so I was playing with layers of lighting. I started illuminating from the sides as well as the uh, scanning bars that cut across. And I also started working with sequencing um, a scroll, so I had portions of an image mounted within there. And I still can't tell you exactly why, but there's a conversation between the representation of nature and then a photograph of actual nature. And there's things about the constructs and the artifice of the photographs that run through it that are segmented as a scroll, and then the idea of just the direct flowers. So these are really fun, and um, I really enjoyed doing them. So I, I worked on the scanner for quite some time in the studio, and then um, following that, I just started raising a lot more questions about photography and how it supports my practice. And with the paintings, like the ones in the museum, it takes you know a solid month of just focusing on a singular thing and trying to find the depth in that. And I really have enjoyed working with the um, spontaneous capture of the iPhone. And so through this whole process of my leave, I was shooting all the time and shooting everything. So this is just from the last two weeks. So there's just a schedule. And I really like that it opens up some of the possibilities. These are images that I enjoy making, but I would find maybe very tedious to paint. So part of my process right now is trying to divine what can fit into the language of photography and what are the benefits of working with uh, paint. So after that, I, um, with the help of Mike, have been working with a 35 millimeter camera and working with color film. And so, uh, which I've never formally really studied, and I realized as much as I refer to it and I joke about how I'm low tech, I really want to find out what it could do. So the last couple, I'll just show these last slides. I've been doing a lot of work with color film, um, moving around Portland, going down to the docks, going to South Portland, the industrial areas, and just looking for found color and looking for found compositions. And talking about perception, both of my colleagues that have talked already talked about like looking into the world and using perception as an opportunity to kind of redefine our relationship to the world and how we see it and how we think about it. And so I'm going around and I'm shooting these things. And of course, there's this incredible time delay. It takes weeks to get them back. So I don't get the immediacy of knowing if I got it. But um, I do have that sort of anticipation. So these are really innocuous just honestly shit that I see that I just really love to see what it looks like in film, as opposed to the hyper-realization of an iPhone, where everything feels like it's in HD and, and 4K. And I think that all the data that the iPhone gets, that's data that's not necessarily even information. It's not information that can easily become knowledge. And I like the idea of film is really selective focus. It feels more like the way my eye works. Um, and so I really like working that way. So. I'm probably going to continue doing this uh, for a while and see. I am curious to see what it will do when I go back into um, painting and the conversation that goes on between them. And that's it. Thank you very much.
Yes, thanks everyone for being here. And uh, I agree with Mike. It's been great for me to see my colleagues work. Usually when we get together, uh, we're talking about the spring schedule or the budget. <laughs> but uh, today we're actually talking about what we do. Um, now I have to figure this out. It worked. Thank you. <laughs> I think we're good. And you can hear me? Do I need to do something else? He said he'd do something. Am I supposed to click on? Oh. Hmm. I'm doing that. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. There it is. Uh, like Mike, I'm going to focus on the piece I have in the show. Uh, it's called Under Northern Sky, painted in 1992. That's 30 years ago, hard to believe. I couldn't be prouder that it's in the Bowdoin College collection, and I couldn't be more grateful to Catherine Watson, who was the director then who purchased it from the museum, and I love having it there. This painting has some strong Bowdoin connections, including the fact that it was painted at the top of Adams Hall which at that time was my studio. This space now has been completely renovated. It's offices for a department I can't name. Psychology? I don't know. Uh, someone else is up there now. But um, when it was, uh, the rumor was when it was a medical school, this is apparently a room where they brought cadavers for vivisection and stuff. So it was nice to share a studio with uh, that history. And you can uh, see the painting there on the easel uh, on the right in the studio. From the studio in 1992, it went to a solo show in New York City at the Tatashev Gallery. And uh, somewhere in there is when Catherine bought it for the museum. And from there, it was in the collection, but it's hung for 30 years in Cleveland House over in Federal Street in the President's House, the ceremonial President's House. And over the years, it's been paired with various things. On a, It's always held that wall for 30 years. And it's been paired with various things, but nothing could be better for me than the Will Barnett which you'll also see in the show. So we're kind of back together. You can almost see us together at the same time. His painting was the same year, has similar palette and similar devices for constructing the painting. So uh, I couldn't be happier with that pairing there. Then the show came up, and as Frank said, uh, we got put on hold. But uh, we were looking at the painting, and after some, at that point, 29, 28, 29 years, there'd been some sinking in, which is a term painters use especially darker pigments dry kind of matte, other ones don't, so the painting becomes uneven. Varnishes rectify that, and uh, the museum very generously and wonderfully put it in the hands of Nina Roth Wells, a painting conservator. This is in her studio in Georgetown, and the painting was brought back to its uh, uh, original luster. Um, so uh, here's the painting, and the one thing you will still see in the painting is something uh, art historians in the audience know this pentimenti uh, changes. This painting is showing its changes. When I was a younger man, pentimenti was an abstract concept that oil paintings over time become more transparent and things that were hidden come back. And I thought, well, I'll never live to see that, but I did. <laughs> because uh, this painting, in fact, has them. If you look very carefully, you'll see traces of uh, the, the projection of light is not doing us favors, but I get the, you get the idea. That is the same painting as I started it. The basic structure is there, the door frame, but before there was a window, there was a tea bowl that I cherish on the windowsill, table in the foreground. The framed artwork stayed. There was a light switch and some other stuff. And on the left, the sequence of doors was there. And then at a later stage, it did this. I opened that up. I thought I'd like it to go that way. And I made a chair that's kind of in this plane. And I worked on it this way for a while, but I grew dissatisfied. It was too much of a... Uh, um, the vanishing point was too, it was pushing too hard for depth. And I like my paintings to slow you down. So I like to put up kind of planes that are stoppages and carry you back more slowly. The original had that, but I had to get back to it somehow. Um, the other thing I should add that's very Bowden about this painting, I'll get to this slide in a moment, is that the foreground is based on a re reference picture I took at Kathy Bradford's house on Mere Point. The screen door is actually from Admiral Perry's uh, house on Eagle Island. 
So a strong Bowdoin connection. That door comes from Admiral Perry's house. And uh, I put the two of them together. Also in my painting, I was thinking by this time, when I start a painting, I always say I start a painting like Mondrian. I just do this, and then I do this, and I do this. And then I, then I put clothes on it. I put light in it, and I put objects in it. But basically, it's always a Mondrian underneath there. But then if you work on something long enough, other meanings begin to come to it, almost like a, an attractor. And I began to realize I was painting the seasons, that the near room was winter, the mudroom was fall and spring, and outdoors was summer. So I actually thought there was a time element in this painting that I wanted uh, to be there. And I also have a memory. I grew up in upstate New York, and my growing up was running through screen doors like that. And when you're about 10 feet on, you'd hear slap right behind you. And that slap was the sign that it's summer, and that you're free, and that life is good. So that's what I wanted that uh, to be there. What you're seeing here is I wanted to tell you how this painting actually started 30 years before that. When I was 12 years old, I was lucky to live on Long Island. They took us to the Met, and I saw this painting for the first time, and my life changed. Um, it just absolutely riveted me. It captivated me. Um, you know, it's Vermeer's Made Asleep. It's hanging at the Met. And the thing that really fascinated me, upper right corner, was the way he got that reflected light. Somehow that really struck me. How did he do that? And I got as close as they'd let me get. And I could actually see it was just two brush strokes perfect brush strokes and very particular brush strokes. But fundamentally, that's what it was. And I couldn't have articulated, but at that moment, I understood what a painting was. It was a structure that reminded you of other things. And I couldn't articulate that. I couldn't act on it, but it was there. And my painting here is very much, this painting lives somewhere. It's deep in my hardwiring. And I think by now you've seen what I'm talking about, that the reflection on that aluminum frame, the reflection on the door frame, the second room, which is a kind of a Vermeerian trope. Um, it's alive in me forever, and it's very much a part of this painting. And then finally, in closing, this painting was part of a group of paintings. They all showed together. This was another one called Second Nature. This is also Kathy Bradford's house. It's another room in her house. But they have similar structures. And finally, this one was actually based on the address that I had on McKean Street at that time, just feet, just hundreds of feet from here. So this painting has a very strong presence in uh, Bowdoin, at Bowdoin and in Brunswick, and I'm really happy to share it with you. Thanks. First of all, thank you for being a part of this. This is such a treat to uh, hear you talk about the work um, and knowing that it's right next door. I can't wait to go back and take a closer look again. So thank you for being with us. Um, to get started, uh, questions. I thought we would reflect a little bit about the history of art instruction at Bowdoin College. Um, the department is celebrating a 60th anniversary this year, but we know that um, art has always been a part of the Bowdoin curriculum. Um, and I'm just wondering what we know about the history of art instruction at, at the college. And I'm going to start <laughs> looking at you <laughs> as somebody who um, uh, has been here for much of, the, um, <clears throat> of this uh, recent history. Sure. As, I'm on, right? Um, there are people in this room that can probably add to and correct and say more. But uh, the person's name who comes to mind is Phil Bean. Um, I'm not sure about where we were in the 19th century and if there's anything resembling what we do. I just don't know. Mm -hmm. Someone might. Mm -hmm. I can't even speak for the first years of the 20th. But uh, Phil gets here, I think, in 1926, somewhere in the 20s, like that, um, uh, from Harvard. And he has an idea that art historians, to do what they do, should have a hands-on experience before they do. So he begins to, I understand this, again, people can add to this and correct me, 
uh, starts to teach that. And of course, as you said, this doesn't become formalized until 1962 when Tom Cornell is hired to actually have a formal curriculum of visual arts uh, study. But uh, Phil, I think, was teaching drawing, and more than that, I don't know. What about the photography instruction with John McKee? Uh, well, uh, I know that John um, started teaching some photography in the late 60s, something around there. And um, originally, he was teaching French. Uh, and he was also really, a, he is a really accomplished um, harpsichord player, too. Um, but I think that um, I think that he started teaching in the basement of the BAC, um, and I think it was actually sort of one of the first places like Bowdoin, or like this, um, like a small li residential liberal arts college that actually had instruction in photography. Um, I was at Williams in the early 80s, and we didn't have that. Um, and then, of course, John McKee's instruction um, was sort of pretty instrumental in the um, careers of a couple very important photographers, Kevin Bugriski, um, Abe Morell, of course, um, and a whole host of others. And he's really beloved. Um, when he retired in 2001, um, many of his former students got together and um, created an endowed fund in his name that supports now um, a lot of uh, sort of different kinds of photographic um, explorations and activities um, in our department. Um, I want to begin my comments, too, with just a huge thanks to each of you. This has been such a treat. And of course, we acknowledge Carrie Skanga in absentia, whose work is also represented in the exhibition. Um, but I learned so much um, from each of your insightful comments. So I want to take Frank's question and sort of grow it a little bit, um, which is to think a little bit more broadly about the role of the visual arts in a liberal arts curriculum. And um, I'd lo we'd love to hear your insights uh, about the role that you feel arts instruction today feels, uh, fills within the larger uh, intellectual context of our campus. And then maybe you know, for, for each of you individually, um, why you think um, arts is such an important piece of a Bowdoin education. And Jim and Jackie, maybe we'll start with each of you. And then um, Mike and Mark, if you have thoughts, we'd love to hear those as well. So um, we talked about this a little bit. I think one of the things that was really lovely to get a chance to see everybody talk about their work um, as Mike was saying, we, we haven't had this opportunity before. I think there's something about engaging the world that is really, really crucial. And I think there's something about a mindfulness of being present and being aware of the generosity of attention. It's really important. And I think one of the things that's really lovely and I love about teaching in this department is helping people refine how they see. Because so much of how we understand the world, I think, is affected by what we see or what we think we see. And I think the idea of engaging things in a really direct, honest manner is a really wonderful way to break down preconceptions. It's a way to break down stereotypes about, we have to make a lot of assumptions about things. And I think that um, that part of a visual arts and, and visual literacy, given how much we rely on the visual and, and contemporary life, I think the idea of refining that and refining our awareness of how we're seeing things and how we channel that is, is really crucial. And so it's a really important role to play. Yeah, well said, I would second that. And I would add, you know, making art, it's a way of having experiences that help us learn, right? It, it's not about making a statement, it's not about producing some finished report, it's, it's about that process, it's about that journey. And all the unexpected challenges and discoveries and connections that come up along the way. Um, and I would say through that process, that very hands-on process, you're building all sorts of skills that extend beyond the visual arts, right? Whether it's your brainstorming, your problem solving, your critiquing, your editing. Um, but beyond that, you're also wrestling with some really big questions about what it means to be alive and what it means to be human and what it means to live a meaningful life. And that um, stays with you. And that you know extends to potentially to everything as you move through Bowdoin and beyond Bowdoin. Um, and I would say the hands-on piece is essential to that, right? That we're not just, um, that we experience the world through our bodies. And when we engage in an inquiry with our 
sense of touch and our vision and we bring that together with an inquiry, it can really enliven us, it can wake up parts of the brain. Some really magical and powerful things can come out of that experience. Thank you so much, Jackie. One of the things that I, I like talking with the students about, um, and I think it goes to your question, um, when I was in college, um, I wasn't smart enough and I certainly wasn't courageous enough to take any art classes. Um, and what I did in college was write papers and I would put them under the professor's door and I'd run, <laughs> okay? And the thing that's really wonderful about the experience of the art classes is that you make things and then you put them up on the wall or you somehow share them um, with your peers and you take a certain kind of responsibility for what it is you're doing and then a certain kind of pride and then a certain kind of self-criticality about what just happened. And so I think that one of the things that our students um, say to me that they really enjoy about their experience in the visual arts generally is that they form really significant bonds with their classmates, um, almost to the point where I think they would call it a community. And they also um, experience um, their own work. Um, I don't know how to say this. Um, they experience the act of looking at their own work as if they were someone else. Um, when it's put up on the wall and they all have to kind of like contend with it. Um, and I think that that's um, a really valuable experience within the context of the other classes that they're um, taking. And of course, ours are the most important. <laughs> sure. Sure. That's a fact. Thank you so much, Mike. I'm thinking of uh, something Joseph Albers said, and of course he was at Yale for years and years, and he entertained this question, and he said the thing that his department did is that the university as a rule is about research, and they were about search. That, uh, and this is not trying to create hierarchies, it's simply saying we go about things differently. And more concretely, when I teach drawing, and someone's drawing a flower like they did last week, no one else has ever drawn that flower before. They are, this goes to Jim's comment, they are very present in a moment, maybe unlike anything in our contemporary experience. It restores you, it brings you to your senses in a very immediate way. Uh, this summer, a painter of mine, Josephine Halverson, had a show at the Goncourt Museum, and in her talk, she said something wonderful. She said, at a time in society when truth is on trial, when truth is under siege, when lies are rampant, the experience of creating art is simply true. It's that moment when you're drawing that, or taking a photograph of a wall. It is unequivocal, there's no, you can't lie. It's just what it is. And she said that's a very bracing experience. I, I think that's something we bring. Thank you so much. At First Light is an exhibition that is about place. Uh, it is uh, two centuries of artists who are responding to uh, this place, Maine. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the way in which um, Maine has shaped your own artistic practice. Um, is this, uh, and how you, perhaps you think about your work relative to the you know, generations of artists who have worked here in the past? Anybody want to try that one out to begin? <laughs> I'll dive in because my picture is just on the screen. Uh, when I painted Under a Northern Sky, I had been here seven years, and it was the first time I dared to utter anything about my opinion about where I was living. <laughs> that painting was meant to capture something I felt about Maine and to become true for me that I tried to describe in my talk. So it, it, I, I, I very respectfully, given that long tradition, yeah. I waited until I felt Yes, I can say that safely. <laughs> I'll give an easy answer. Yeah, I paint the landscape. I love the main landscape. I've responded to it forever. And um, I used to live in Savannah, Georgia. I used to live in Indiana. And I would drive my Datsun B210 up to Maine. <laughs> and I would like do plein air painting and then eat bad food and I would leave. And then I would do larger studio works based on it. And there was something intrinsically I just subcognitively identified with the aspects of the landscape. And I think it, a lot of it was the coast because I only occasionally was able to go inland. And um, I just really loved the collision of things. There was a history here, but it was the direct experience that really spoke to me. The physicality of it and the light and um, the kind of ruggedness. And the people were lovely. And I was really lucky to be able to get a job here. 
um, because I used to come here, I used to do paintings of Maine when I was living in the Midwest. And sometimes there were memories of Maine. So there's something very intrinsically I really connected with. I really love it. And I feel incredibly lucky to be here. That's me. So, so I'm, it's Jack, um, Jackie and Mike, I don't know if you want to chime in. in. Well, I was just going to say that um, it's, it's, um, it's foundational, I mean, the connection to um, the place. I mean, I, I, maybe because I moved around a lot as a kid, um, and all of my memory is um, place-based. Like, you know, I can basically um, tell when something happened based on where I was. Um, and so, you know, uh, being here, the only response that I can think about when I first moved here was like, I've got to go explore it and figure out, you know, do I, where do I belong or how do I belong? And then the river project was a direct um, uh, outgrowth of that desire to try to um, figure out where I was. Um, I was lucky enough to talk about it a lot with a colleague here, Matt Klingel, environmental historian. Um, he was, you know, similarly coming from the West and um, trying to figure that question out too. Um, so yeah, place is, place is huge. Place is really, really big. I would, as soon as you asked that question, I immediately could see this place at Potts Point. When I first moved here, I would drive down 123 to Harpswell every week. And when you walk out there, you can see the rocks shift on their side mm -hmm. and just like the forces of nature that just moved earth and that history of the layers in the rock was really striking when I first moved here. Um, and I can see how over time things like that have seeped into my work, not necessarily in a conscious way, but I'm making rocks. And in my studio right now, I'm working on a very different project, but I'm still making rocks. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I want to ask one more question, and then we're going to open it up to the floor because we're eager to hear your questions. Um, but as we think about this question of place, um, obviously one very critical connection that you each have to Maine is your relationship specifically to Bowdoin College. And one of the things that I admire so much about each of you and that I hear each of you echo the importance of in different ways all the time is the fact that you are each educators. You are extraordinarily accomplished artists, visual artists in your own right, but I know from speaking with each of you that being a teacher is a really important part of your practice. And I wondered if you could speak to the role of teaching in your development as artists and how that fits into your own sense of your creative identity. I steal from them every opportunity. <laughs> as, as, they say, as they say, great ideas are stolen. <laughs> Mediocre ideas are borrowed. <laughs> That's wonderful. I mean, the thing about it is that um, this is one of the most privileged um, positions that I think I occupy that maybe we occupy. I mean, as far as, and I tell this to the students without trying to make their heads too big, um, that. <laughs> It's pretty amazing to be able to work with them, right? And um, to be able to sort of think about ways that um, I can try to just basically s stay out of their way mm -hmm. um, and, and sort of see um, where they go. Um, and so, you know, to be able to be in a situation like that where that can be the reality is really um, amazing, amazing. It was very privileged. Um, and so I'm constantly pinching myself um, when, uh, when that sort of, you know, when this question comes up, basically, which it does all the time. I have a different take on this. We've heard the expression, doctor, heal thyself. Mm -hmm. There's times I'll be in the studio and I'll be struggling with something, and I'll come on the answer and I'll realize, oh, I just told my class that last week. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, I have a, a kind of a knowledge that I mm -hmm. work with in the classroom, but oddly enough, sometimes I don't bring it into my studio until it comes up and I think, you know this. Mm -hmm. You tell people this all the time. You know, get your act together. That's wonderful. The other thing, uh, we all, every semester we offer, we each teach an introductory course. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's really important. I'm constantly starting from scratch with students, day one, sculpture one, why does it matter? Why should you be here? Why should you care? And, and co continuously having those conversations with students really keeps it alive for me, keeps those questions and the value of what we're doing um, really fresh for me. And it does influence my own practice. 
I would echo that. That's really well put. I feel the same way. I just feel in some ways I'm an introvert by nature. And so in some ways it's terrifying to teach, but it's also incredibly exhilarating to have that feedback loop. And also it just keeps me focused on things like teaching drawing one all the time. I'm always kind of recalibrating like why is this important to leave in and what am I trying to accomplish and why is that important? And I think they keep me honest that way too. So I can't, I can't steer off into my cul-de-sac so easily. Mm -hmm. I think it keeps me tethered into a conversation and that's really helpful for me. So I feel very lucky. That's wonderful. Well, we feel very lucky to have you and, and colleagues. Um, and thank you so much for your reflections. Um, but we do want to open things up to the floor. Um, many of you have had an opportunity to work um, with these extraordinary people in the classroom um, at different points, um, perhaps along the way. Um, others of you obviously have worked with them as colleagues or um, uh, had an opportunity um, perhaps to um, get to know them just in the context of this conversation. So we would really welcome um, your questions, your observations, and I think that uh, we are now going to pass off one of our microphones. Um, Frank maybe can play Vanna White, if he doesn't mind. And uh, we'll just help pass the microphone around. And we will ask you to speak into the mic, even if you have a big, booming voice. Uh, simply because we want to capture this for the recording. Hi there. Just want to ask, do you ever collaborate with your students on a project? <laughs> I haven't. No. But I don't know. When I teach public art, it's very collaborative. Uh, the designs will come from them, but we're very much a team, and I'll be on the wall painting with them while they're painting. It'll be their work, but, and I'm guiding them in it, but that happens. And my approach is, it's, it's, it's old fashioned, but um, I, I, I think that there's amazing value in um, being alone and, and trying to find uh, your way and, um, and running up against obstacles. In other words, um, trying to really shape the struggle, um, and then coming back and then showing or sharing it with other people that are similarly engaged. Um, and so that's kind of how I usually couch it. Um, but I, I think that the collaboration that might happen is one that's happening in the darkroom for the students in the class, where they go in and they're struggling with making prints and they help each other. Um, and so that I think that naturally, in the in the, at least the way that they're working in the darkroom, um, it, it it is collaborative to some extent, um, but it's not one that's um, designed uh, specifically that way. Hi, my name is Joe McDevitt. Um, it's incredibly insightful, and I, like Michael, I never took a, uh, an art course uh, at college here in Bowdoin, but uh, unlike Michael, I haven't done anything in art since either, so <laughs> I'm completely, this is very, uh, like a complete eye-opening uh, experience to hear uh, the value and the magnitude of, of the actual experience of, you know, creating art and, and how much that can mean to not only the artists, but you know, to students who are working uh, to create art, um, it's just something I hadn't even. Because as a sort of call, call me Joe Public, uh, you know, you go, art to me is about the finished what, what you see and what it mean, what the, that the value of the, what the actual finished. Uh, and um, so I, I guess in a way I'm kind of thinking fascinating to hear about the different uh, medium and the fact that. Uh, you know, the iPhone, we've all got iPhones in our pocket. Uh, I guess the question for Michael is if, you know, and Big Blue, you know, basically is now beating, or whatever it is, it's now beating all the chess masters. I mean, if, if tomorrow there was a technology with AI and iPhone and God knows what that would create the same image that you go to all that trouble to create with your, your glass, um, would, you, would you be happy to use that or is it, the process so fundamental to the end result that you would you would still you would still want to be in that black room the portable black room working doing all that hard work 
Um, well, one of the, this ties into one of the reasons why um, I've been trying to advocate strongly, continue to advocate strongly for the students in the beginning photo class to continue to shoot film. Um, and, you know, part of it is the, um, how to live within um, uncertainty and, and how to respond and adjust to things that you don't necessarily expect. And in fact, learn from and even um, springboard off of um, what you don't expect or what actually are maybe termed as accidents. Um, and so I think that the, the, the reason why, for instance, I'm us I used and love the wet play process is because I have a, 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 a sort of an intense conversation with the materials. Um, and so that it's so, it's so kind of time consuming and, and arduous and magical and flawed um, because I don't get perfect images. I get the edges do weird things and the chemicals do weird things. It means that um, I have to be, I'm humbled <laughs> actually by um, the gifts that it provides me at the same time as I'm trying to impose or at least get something from it. Um, and so that it's, that it's that push and pull and that give and take that is so exciting. And I tell the students this and I really believe this when it comes to making things. If you can be surprised by what you make, that really increases the chances that someone else who views it or encounters it will be surprised as well. And I mean surprised in a kind of like uh, opening up a sense of what's possible. Um, so um, I don't, I, you know, it doesn't mean that I don't make pictures digitally. Um, I do, um, but there's different tools for different reasons. Wonderful. One question right here. It's good to see many of you again. Um, I feel like in class we've probably talked at some point. Uh, for those who I've had class with, Mike and, and Jackie, good to see you again. Um, we've, I've talked about like spirituality, um, at least from my perspective, and how art sort of like questions or explores like my own sense of spirituality. Are there any comments that you think are like tidbits of sort of like uh, uh, of knowledge or lessons that you've drawn from your artistic production. Um, I don't, I mean also, I guess, does your art sort of fuel you or challenge you spiritually? Um, and then I guess from that, like what are the tidbits that you might share with us as an arts community um, just towards spiritual growth? That's a big one. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would, I would say that, um, Making it slows me down, and that's so valuable. That absorption in the moment, and that slowing down, and that feeling part of something bigger than myself. I had a mentor who would, used to say, "You're working on the material, and the material's working on you." Mm -hmm. And so there's this reciprocity. There are these shifts that are happening as you're engaged in the process. So for me, that's where I might start to answer that question. But it's a big question. I mentioned the, the term discernment, right? And I mean, that, that comes from my buddy Macaulay, um, who's a fellow fisherman. I can't call him a fellow fisherman. He's a god of a fisherman. <laughs> and, and, um, and I'm just like, you know, catching in his wake. Um, but he's, a, he's a, also a chaplain. And he, he talks a bit about, um, about discernment. And I, I believe that um, coming into a situation and withholding judgment and trying to have it talk to you and have you kind of open yourself up to it, um, I think is, it's a, it, I think it's a spiritual act, or at least it certainly involves a certain level of faith. Now, um, how that manifests and what that actually means, I think, depends on the person a lot. But I also think that encountering uncertainty and trying to find ways that you can adjust to it or let it be um, has a spiritual component as well. I think of a metaphor that uh, when you tell someone a riddle, the one thing you don't tell them is the answer to the riddle. Mm -hmm. And so spirituality is almost the answer to my riddle. I'll never talk about it. I don't go in the studio thinking about it. I won't ask, how can I make this painting more spiritual? Or how can this painting reconnect with spirit? It's just an eminence. It's there. I just let it be. And after this, I won't talk about it again. <laughs> 
know, it's interesting. I think there's one more question, but something I just want to observe as an art historian as a, and a curator, and in response partially to that wonderful question about technology, which I think also fits with this question about spirituality, I think that when we define what a work of art means in terms of objects that we acquire for the museum or objects that we put on view, we are looking for objects that express something ineffable that is about ultimately the human experience. And Mike, I really liked what you said earlier about this notion of struggle. And I was very struck in each of your presentations about the degree to which you are each so sensitive about the relationship of your medium to the message or some of the overall themes that you're addressing in your artwork. And I feel like that's, the, to me, the human dimension, but also, um, if you will, um, the spiritual dimension that somehow gets at something we can't necessarily put into words, but that touches us. And that ultimately, I think, motivates and touches artists, uh, artists, yes, but also other audiences um, over many generations. So I love that combination of, of questions. Thank one, you. One of the things that Teju Cole was here last year and, mm. and gave a wonderful talk, and he visited our, our uh, class. And one of the things he said that I thought was very spiritual, too, is this idea that the reason why he writes and photographs, because he does both mm -hmm. really nicely in tandem, is to um, test and actually try to confirm the fact that we're not alone. That's beautiful. Thank you. Yes. It's a question about the humanities um, and what many have seen as the decline of the humanities in institutions like this across the United States. Um, in English, uh, enrollments have gone down. Interestingly, creative writing is a place where some of that energy has, has uh, reinvigorated a field. Do you feel the making of art um, and its relationship to the history of art um, is, is something where the, the making invigorates the, the historical look? Mm -hmm. I, I'll jump in. Absolutely. I was lucky enough, I met Phil Beam when I first landed here. He was such a lovely guy, and he used to um, paint down in the basement of this building, right across the hall, because he couldn't go home. He had retired, but he was told he's got to stay out all day. And he, and, he, and he set up in that office, and he used to paint. And he was just doing Chardins all the time, and he couldn't have been more lovely. But I talked to him briefly when I landed, and one of the things that he talked about is he felt it was so important that people studying art history make something. Mm -hmm. And that there is a kinesthetic awareness and understanding that transforms it. And I, and I certainly feel that. I feel like some of the works that I strong, respond the strongest to, I have a kinesthetic relationship and I can imagine the process, and it's an aggregation of experiences that culminates in something most of the time. And I, so I think that that changes how we see things. And I have students that come in from art history and they'll be in my painting class and they'll be, I'll talk about a process and they're like, oh, we just looked at that last week, you know? So I think there's an interconnectedness and there's also that sort of, you know, Jackie was talking about how there's a, there's a thing you can learn by making that you can't arrive at cognitively, I think. And that it's through the process of making that you discover what you don't already know. And I think it's incredibly valuable that whole process of what we do. And we augment it, and we're in conversation with art history because, I mean, it seems kind of obvious, but I mean, knowing what has come before, you can add a link to it, where it's Newton standing on the shoulder of giants comment, something like that. So I think it's really, really crucial. And I also think that the concern around enrollments um, isn't one we share in visual arts, weirdly enough. I mean, I, I think we could probably do um, a better job of getting our students to continue on more from our intro mm -hmm. classes, um, but at the same time, one of the one of the things that's really um, unfortunate, I think it's unfortunate, is that we turn away a lot of students that sign up for our intro classes. They fill every single semester. Um, so uh, it's an interesting, um, maybe that's an indication of something, I'm not sure. This conversation right now is looping back to something Frank asked earlier about our history. Phil Beam was mentioned. Uh, the thing I forgot to mention, Phil Beam is a product of Harvard. Uh, pedagogically, Harvard has very little use for folks like us. They do have an art department. They don't put a lot of stock in it. Yale does. And interestingly, as a Harvard guy, he actually modeled us after Yale, which is that the arts could be actually a participant like you're describing. 
So I think the whole reason we're sitting here, thanks to Phil Beam, is that he took that model, he felt it was that important, disagreeing with his own alma mater. I've heard them say that, yes, Yo-Yo Ma went here, but he was a philosophy major. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, don't I... want to, they don't want to hear about this. <laughs> That's a joke. That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, I think your, your comment about Phil Beam is a wonderful reminder that we all stand on the shoulders of giants. And it is uh, such a privilege um, to be part of this extraordinary um, institution which has such a strong history of um, commitment to experimentation, to thinking about something larger than ourselves. And to my mind, that's something that I see each one of you and your students modeling every day. Um, we are so grateful that you could each be with us this evening, um, take the time to speak with us about the works of art that are on view. I am delighted to say that um, uh, At First Light will be on view um, until the 6th of November, so there's still time um, to go and enjoy each of those um, paintings, to enjoy the exhibition as a whole, to take advantage of the museum. Um, we hope that we'll have a chance to see all of you um, many times again in the near future. And of course, um, we're delighted that um, our wonderful colleagues um, are always accessible. So uh, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Thank you for a wonderful conversation. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.